Hello there, just before you start listening to this week's bonus episode, I just want to note that when we recorded this, Betty White was alive, and when I am now editing it, Betty White is no longer alive. And as she is one of the major stars of the show we are looking at, that's going to come up in the episode. So just wanted to explain that might seem a bit of a disparity here. And also just wanted to say, you know, Betty White, this one's for you. Thank you for the decades. And I'm glad we only said nice things about you. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the British Sitcom History Podcast. My name is Alan. With me, as always, is Gareth. Hello. And joining us on this special occasion are the Sado Podcast, the the members of Sado Podcast, that are Al and Ben. Hi. Hi, thanks for having us. It's lovely to have you. Very lovely to have you, yes. And so you are a sitcom-based podcast, just as we are. You, You do... Well, I'll I'll let you explain what you do. We are a listen-along podcast. So we uh, watch episodes of different TV shows from the, currently from the 70s and 80s. And then we deep dive each episode one by one and take you from the start to the finish um, on a meandering um, journey. It's a really great journey. If if any of our listeners haven't listened to the Sado podcast, I would really recommend it. You've done The Good Life and Faulty Towers so far. And uh, that brings us on to what we are going to be talking about today, which is Snavely, which was one of the um, short-lived American remakes of Faulty Towers. So we we Mm. all have Faulty Towers in common, so we're going to take Snavely apart. And of course, (laughs) the other thing we have in common is that our third series is going to be dedicated to Dear John, and I know that... You, Gareth, are a massive fan of Dear John, so that's... I am a huge fan of Dear John, as our listeners will know. Now, I'm really looking forward to your uh, your watch-along 12-hour version of Dear John. It's going to be fantastic. I'm really looking forward to it. Well, that's the kind of guy we are. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let me ask you, um, when you decide which shows you're going to do... Uh, do, uh, is the number of episodes a dis- uh, and a factor in your decision making? Because I've noticed you haven't gone with Last of the Summer Wine <laughs> yet. Well, 390 have... episodes or whatever there is. How many times can you discuss three men rolling down a hill in a bath? That's the thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it does come into it, doesn't it? Yeah, it does definitely come into it. Yeah. I mean, this last this Dear John decision was based on a um, poll of our email subscribers and Facebook group members, oh. we put it to the poll. It definitely keeps the momentum when you do shorter series, when, you, when you're looking yeah. at each episode. Yeah. And, and like Ben said, when you are talking about the same things, like, mm. especially Fashion Corner, which is um, <sighs> when you're looking at the same clothes week in, week out, something like Last of the Summer Wine would be a lot of chat around wrinkly tights. Mm. <laughs> but yes, we're going we're gonna to actually have a look at one of the ill-fated American remakes of Faulty Towers. Uh, of which there were several. There was um, Amanda, starring B. Arthur, of course, which ran for mm. nearly a series before it was cancelled. There was Whispering Pines, starring John Larroquette in the late 90s. John Larroquette's quite a good comedic actor, actually, but you wouldn't know it from watching this awful remake of Faulty Towers. Mm-hmm. And there was... The Royal Pain. Can you imagine that? that they <laughs> they Royal called Pain. The, character the character Royal Pain. Yeah. As, Royal is not a name. I'll give you Pain as a surname. <laughs> Royal, no. Well, that's just, it's pathetic. <laughs> and, of course, there was also um, Over the Top, which isn't really a Faulty Towers remake, but it's based, it kind of nicks some of the settings and characters from Faulty Towers, which had Tim Curry and a very young Steve Carell in as the Manuel character. Mm. But the, the one we're going to focus on today is Snavely from 1978. Snavely was the first attempt to remake Faulty Towers and it's the purest I guess it was mm. made even before the second series of Faulty Towers mm. was made and it is the most straightforward hey let's just take these characters put them in America and it's essentially the same thing mm. obviously we'll get into the details of what they've changed yeah whereas some of the later ones it's much more adapted to fit so with the Amandas for example it's just be Arthur she doesn't have a, a spouse to bounce off of mm. uh, it's, it's just kind of Basil without uh, Sybil so that's a big miss straight away but yeah, so Snavely, it was made in 1978 as a pilot, uh, and that's as far as it got. It was not turned into a series. Are you surprised by that? I am a little bit, you know. I, I, don't, I thought it wasn't <laughs> as bad as I expected it to be. I don't know about you guys. Yeah. I felt similar. 
I yeah. thought there was there was more of a warmth to it than faulty, especially the the the, Sib- the Sibylish character of, mm-hmm. of Mrs. Snavely just felt. Mm. I, I've got a, I've got a, a bit of a hatred for the Sybil character. I don't like her at all. But I felt yeah. like Betty White's version of the wife in the in the um, in the sitcom. I think I think we should just I, call her Sybil. Her. I'm happy with that. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mrs. Snavely. <laughs> She's called Mrs. Gladys. If she you, is if called Gladys. Like yeah. <laughs> I felt more of a, an, an, an affinity towards towards her. Oh, that's interesting. So I felt it was, I, I agree that it was very similar. It felt like a remake of, well, it was the Hotel Inspectors mostly, wasn't mm. it? Uh, but it was, it was, it was like bizarro Faulty Towers. It just, <laughs> it, it just felt like it was in a different octave or something. It just wasn't quite, didn't quite chime. I'm quite looking forward to talking about it actually, because I sort of watched it and I thought, it wasn't as bad as I expected. I totally agree with you there. Mm. But I'm not sure. I just, I can't quite make my mind up over it. D- did I enjoy that or was it, it was just sort of the wrong note or something? So, yeah, let's talk about it. Well, I think to answer your question, though, I am actually surprised it didn't get picked up because although it was sanitized for American audience and changed, I would have thought they gobbled it up. And I actually, in my reading, read that it was actually received quite well. Well, I think, yeah, Faulty Towers is one of those things that has translated across the world really well, like not just in English speaking countries, even because there's a lot of physical comedy in there. I think it works There's a lot of very universal themes of just anger and frustration. But there is something quite innately British about it. Mm. Very much the class system is put under the microscope in, mm. in Faulty Towers. And Basil Faulty is the epitome of the middle class, I look up to him, I look down to him <laughs> kind of kind of attitude. I'm interested to see how well that would translate to, a, to an American audience. The name, Snavely, obviously it's the character's surname. I think that's much better than Faulty. And we, we actually didn't pick up on this when we talked about Faulty Towers. But I think that's a crap name. Because <laughs> Faulty, it's not really a surname. And it's like, ooh, faulty towers. You get it? It's faulty. Not quite right. yeah. <laughs> you get it? yeah. You're right. I've never even considered that. But yeah. snivelly doesn't mean anything. But it is. It just sounds like snivelling and kind of. Well, it's you just know, a sort of grotesque word. Five minutes ago, we were taking the mick out the Americans with using royal pain. That's not a name. Well, yeah. Yeah, I suppose you could say the same about Basil Faulty, True. couldn't True. you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I think it, it's one of those things that that now you see it and you think, oh yeah, Basil Faulty. Uh, yeah, true, and the, true. The, the fact that faulty yeah. towers is even a pun is sort of lost it's just oh it's just Basil <laughs> Faulty's place isn't it so, mm-hmm. but yeah I do like the name Snavely it's just got the right level of, sort of grotesqueness about it and well it's a bit snivelly isn't it That's snivelly a, yeah. and snidey yeah what, what, the first thing I wrote down in my notes the very first thing was the sign is spelled correctly. <laughs> of course, <laughs> that's no yeah. Good, is it? yeah, yeah. That's no good. So there was no mail boy. No, no, there was no paper boy coming yeah. over and uh, and changing the letters around. Now I'm just trying to think of a well, anagram of Snavely Manor. I have done the thinking for you. <laughs> oh, brilliant! So, so Man- these, manly these, valor. <laughs> I I came up with, and when I say I came up with, let's full disclosure here. I used an anagram thing on the internet. <laughs> so oh, you cheat! What I came up with was Elvin Masonry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Von Manslayer. <laughs> yeah, all right. Or Man Layovers. Oh, yeah. Man Layovers, man layovers like is a good one. Yeah. It's supposed to be a motel, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, that's very good. Although, you know, if we're going to be pedantic about it, in Faulty Towers, they, they sometimes move letters around and drop letters, yeah. don't they? Mm. They do. Right, shall we go inside the building? Yeah, when, when, we, when we go into the, the lobby and we see the first scene in the lobby, the Manuel character who we later find out is, is named Pedro, is sort of awkwardly hanging around, looking at the phone anxiously because the phone's ringing and he's obviously, his English mm. isn't good enough. And he's, and cue Golden Girls era, Betty White comes bustling through with a load of shopping and answers the phone. I love that. I was so excited to see Betty White. Yes. You were, were you a Golden Girls fan? Al? I, was a, I was a Golden Girls fan. I loved Golden Girls. And so I. I just think that she's just one of the most genuinely lovely Non Hollywood, despite the fact that she's sort of centered in Hollywood person, I think she's just fab. Yeah, I like her, and I, I loved Golden Girls. That was right in my sort of era of watching. Yeah, staying up on a Friday night mm. watching. Channel Friday 4. night, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. She tells the caller when she answers the phone, Roger, to hold on while she gets while she gives Pedro a toilet roll to take up to room seventeen. And instead of K, we get a sort of animalistic grunt from Pedro. <laughs> mm. Yeah, he's sort of the same level of Manuel's confusion, but he's. 
He's, he's, he's just not as well-rounded a character, Pedro, because he, uh, he doesn't speak hardly any English. Manuel spoke He's hardly English. a character. It's it's a shame, isn't it? It feels like it's a missed, a missed step right from the beginning. To me, this is one of the biggest... This is the, big, this is the biggest miss, actually. This yeah. Is the biggest uh, negative for it is that, essentially, the Manuel character's not, not really present. He, mm. w- w- he's called Pedro, and I, I, my first thought was... Well, that's interesting. A sort of a Hispanic character in America means something very different to a Spanish yeah. character in England. But, mm. but actually, we find out later he's supposed to be Albanian. Yeah, yeah. weird. That does strike me as we don't want to make him Hispanic in America. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that has to, like, let's just make it. Let, I mean, Albania may as well be a made up country. It can be like yeah. Fredonian. Yeah. In 1978, <laughs> there are not, the, nobody's writing in from Albania to complain about the stereotype. <laughs> yeah. Do you think they were worried about political correctness in 1978 in America, being a more litigious society? I don't think they were worried about upsetting the commies in Albania. Oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> but also, it has to be someone kind of alien. I think if you have someone, a Hispanic, there's enough of a Hispanic community in America that it doesn't feel like, oh, well, that's obviously someone who's going to be completely out of their, their realm and it's totally alien. Yeah. yeah. You need someone who's completely separate. The, the, the one thing that I've noticed in attempts to remake Faulty Towers is the Manuel character is so easy to get wrong. The balance of is he actually stupid or just lost in language? And I certainly the the way John Cleese justifies that character and how he says the reason that character works is because he never feels bad. Like you never feel like he's the victim because he always just takes all the abuse with a smile and a and a thank you. Mm-hmm. As basically as justification, if you felt that he was being bullied and oh, I feel really bad for him, it wouldn't work as comedy. That's mm, true. It's a but that's a very thin line, and even on Faulty Towers, they they tread a very thin line with it. And obviously, when that it works, it's easy to overlook how good Andrew Sachs is in the role. Mm, yeah, and it's when you see Manuel done poorly that you appreciate the subtleties of of, of his naivety and in the way he plays Manuel with such naivety mm. but charm at the same and time and the physicality of and yeah, the physicality yeah. of it as well such a skill I, mm. I, I agree with you I think it was a really amazing performance and you can see the difference here I don't yeah. think I don't think this uh, Frank Lalogia is doing anything wrong particularly but there's just nothing there to do is there mm. no don't blame him at all and we see the same jokes that we've seen in Faulty Towers so Betty White's character she does the signs where it says you know the number of the room and up you know an up arrow saying take yeah. this to this room but in when basil does that in faulty towers there's there's the build up to it there's because he's on the phone and so he's doing that because he can't speak to him you know it's all kind of makes sense whereas she's on the phone and then she goes oh just bear with me a second and then does it to him i don't know it just doesn't work well, as well she doesn't, it doesn't do doesn't it in an exasperated well. way does she she does it in a very patient yeah she's very patient and kind as you would expect from a betty white kind of character I just think the pacing is the big thing that's missing. Cleese yeah. talks a lot about the pacing of Faulty Towers is what keeps mm. it going. And here it's just very gentle and, and sanitised and Americanized. I think. The jokes land, but it's more of like a, a small bounce rather than it hitting in the mm. way that they do in Faulty Towers where they're sort of like in-your-face jokes. And I think in, in Snavely they just feel a little, like you say, more gentle, expected humour and comedy, I think. So one one of the main problems in adapting something like this to an American version is, first of all, your American slot is, what, 22 minutes? Yeah. Um, it doesn't translate as well to, like, a BBC 28 minutes. And, and you know, Faulty Towers was always over-filmed anyway. They always overwrote it and then had to cut some stuff out. Um, and also, bear in mind, this was a pilot. It's not necessarily supposed to stand up as a full episode. It's kind of like, here's a load of stuff. Have a look at this. So they've taken a few bits from different episodes. Yeah. Oh, definitely, yeah. So you've got to see it in those terms a little bit, uh, trying not to judge it too harshly. But I think as, as you you guys have alluded to, it's sort of better than I expected it to be. It's it's watchable. It's it's not it's not an aberration yeah, or anything, is so. it? So um, the next thing is, of course, um, Betty's explaining to her caller because we don't know Betty White's character's name at this point. We'll call her Betty White Sybil. She's explaining to her <laughs> caller that to her caller that they're about half full at the moment in the hotel, or they were that morning, but she's been out shopping. But the problem is that every time she leaves Henry, who's clearly the Basil character, she worries about how many guests they're going to lose. And at this point, <laughs> you see the Henry character sort of lurking in the background, coming into view, listening to Sybil, Betty White, flirting with her caller. She's very flirty with him. 
Rog, <laughs> she calls him Rog. Yeah. Well, I thought that was interesting, the different... Because obviously, oh, I know, you get Sybil on the phone. <laughs> None of that, and no. she's And she's just, basically, the, the phone call is irrelevant. It's what she's ignoring is, is what's important. Whereas in this is a slightly different dynamic. She's, she's flirting with this other fella, and that's, yes. that's kind of a different thing, isn't it? I think when Sybil flirts, Basil is more contemptuous, whereas this guy, as we later find out, is jealous. I mean, Basil's yes. not jealous. He just doesn't like her bringing the tone down. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Henry's yeah. like, oh, what's going on here with this Rog? Actually, I thought she was flirting with a guy called Raj at first. I thought it was like a Indian character or something because <laughs> of the Very pronunciation. Very thinking for the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I, I think we probably didn't talk about when we covered Faulty Towers is Cleese's dress, his outfit, his costume. Mm. Yeah, and and yeah. now comparing it, what they did really well with Basil Faulty was... He was dressed smartly, but looked not not untidy, but just harassed. Yeah. They made him. Yes. They made his costume look harassed, which is quite skillful. It was that manic element of whatever he was mm. wearing just looked manic, no matter yeah. what. How do you what do that with a suit on. and a tie? I, it's, I don't know. It's brilliant. A zip up cardigan, and he just looks wild. <laughs> is it the clothes, or is it is it Cleese? Is it the brilliance of Cleese acting in that role that, that Quite conveys possibly. that? I think he's just got that kind of body shape. It's just mm. a bit too long and, and lanky yeah. that it's just nothing quite looks like it doesn't quite fit him. You know, Harvey Corman's a similar body type, isn't he? As, as, as Harvey Corman is our Henry in this in Snavely. He's just not as gangly, I guess. Mr. Snavely had what I see as being a typical 1970s combo of powder blue slacks and lemon yellow shirt, which... <laughs> Uh, which you see, I don't know. I, I just picture like a lineup picture in a golf club in the seventies, oh, and everyone having yes. having them slacks and that color of, of of shirt. And he also adds a powder blue jacket later on in the scene with a bright red carnation, which is something else I sort of think about with with I think a Ted Borvis from. Um, <laughs> that's a, with, that's with a the great red, reference. The I. red carnation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a really good. That's a really good comparison. I like it. We, we see at this point Henry pop round the front of the counter and he pops down a very unconvincing looking goat head, which is even worse than Basil's moose in the Germans. <laughs> yes. I mean, it looks like a big plush toy, doesn't it? I couldn't figure out what it was at first. I didn't know. I, it... they, they actually say it's a goat, don't they? Do people put goat's heads on the wall? I've never heard of that. It couldn't be very hard to hunt a goat, could it? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the joke. He went hunting and that's all he got. Yeah. That's all he broke back. <laughs> Henry also gets some exposition in here that he, he actually hates the hotel business. He hates the guests, the expenses. You say exposition there. I mean, he, he just goes, I hate the guests. I hate working in the hotel business. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very much. Very, very <laughs> it's, not, it's not subtly woven in. But again, this is a pilot episode. You, got, you, got, you want to establish the characters nice and quickly. Mm. So I'm not going to be too harsh about that. Look, we live here too. Why is everything for the guests? Because we are in the hotel business. God, how I hate it. <laughs> Beg, you borrow, you steal, you, you work like a dog to build a business, and what have you got? A half-empty hotel. <laughs> Which was full when you inherited it. We're getting quite a lot from his character straight away, and, and this is what Harvey Corman does. He's, he's very big. And I actually think that works really well. What I really liked was the dynamic of the two of them, because the way Betty White is playing it is quite deadpan. She doesn't really give much away. And whereas Harvey Corman is very big and over the top. And that is quite Basil and Sybil, really, as we know them. Uh, Sybil has her moments, obviously, but largely she's the cool headed one. Yeah, I, I agree with you. The dynamic's actually quite good. It's different, subtly different, but it works, I think. It's it's by, it's by far from being the worst thing in this in this pilot. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, well, well would, would this be a good time to give you a bit of background on these guys? Yeah, um, sure. I did sort of... I looked, yeah. in, I looked into the actors because obviously I'm familiar with Betty White to, a, to an extent. She's something of a, a, a living legend as, as of time of recording, still living. Yeah, <laughs> okay. and... don't, don't put the lockers <laughs> on her, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Harvey Corman was fairly unknown to me apart from this, really. So You're I, joking. I, do, See, this is where... Do, do either of you two know... Where, where do you know Harvey Common from? One one thing. No? no. It's just me. No. Bla He's the guy from Blazing no. Saddles. He's yeah. Headley Lamar in Blazing Saddles. Ah. That is, I, I, th that's all I know him from. I looked on IMDb and I don't know him from anything else at all, but I instantly knew him as the guy from Blazing Saddles when I saw right. him. I, I, that must be an age thing. Am I, I think I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not familiar enough with Blazing Saddles to remember the, the, that sort of specifics, I'm afraid. But basically, both Harvey Common and Betty White 
at this point in 1978 were at a stage in their careers where they were looking for something. They were looking for the next big show because they'd both just left shows in which they were well established. So mm. Harvey Corman was a, a supporting player on the Carol Burnett show, which was sort of variety sketch, sketch comedy. comedy. Yeah. Mm. And so he was a sketch comedy actor. And I think that comes across here. There's a subtle difference between sketch comedy acting and more sitcom comedy acting. It's subtle, but yeah, I I do think we're seeing that here. And um, he left that show after ten years, and he was a he won a lot of awards on that show for like comedy awards and things. Like he was a big deal, and he left that show in 1977 after ten years. He was replaced by Dick Van Dyke, actually. Oh. Interesting. Another living legend at the time of broadcast. <laughs> yeah, just just about, uh, and yeah, he'd just been in Blazing Saddles. He was he did a few of things with Mel Brooks, and then in 1978 he got his own show called the Harvey Corman Show. That was a sitcom in which he was an actor slash acting teacher. So the idea is he's a bit of a crap out of work actor, bothering his agent all the time, and uh, he lives with his daughter, and hilarity ensues. D- has, sorry, hasn't Michael Douglas just made that? There was a, there was a <laughs> program on Netflix. I, I'm not going to remember what it was called because I can't. I haven't got a memory. But it was Michael Douglas who stars as an, an acting coach, and he yes. ru- runs a company with his daughter. The Kaminsky Method. The Kaminsky yeah. Method. Thank you, Al. Sort of yeah, much better memory than me. It's very good. Yeah. Yeah. No, I quite. I enjoyed it. But yeah, that sounds very much like what you just described. It does. Well, they got in the 70s. They would have called that the Michael Douglas show. <laughs> and yes, they would. <laughs> yes, <absolutely. laughs> Because that's what they did. But so they made that in 78 and it didn't do anything. They did a handful of episodes and it just didn't go anywhere. And then Betty White, similarly, like Betty White, she's so old that TV didn't even exist when she started acting. She she started on the radio. She, and really fascinating. I was just reading up about Betty White. Like you think, oh yeah, Betty White, I know Betty White. But I was reading about her and there's a lot more going on there than I realized. She was she, she, like an early female producer. She was. She was a big right from the 50s. She she did a sitcom in the 50s, starting in 1952, called uh, Life with Elizabeth, in which she was Elizabeth. She was the central character. And she was the producer on that. Uh, you know, this is a very early sitcom. Mm. Uh, and yeah, there was one, I was reading something, you know, again, this is in the 50s, a show she did, and she hired a female director. Like, that was very, <laughs> like, crazy in the 50s. And also, they had a supporting actor who was a black man. And it was, and like, and some of the Southern networks were like, oh, we don't want to show this because there's a black person in it. And and she was like, well, tough. You got to deal with it. And like, you just look into Betty White. She's on the right side of history, like all the yes. way around. Like mm. she's all very pro LGBT and all this sort of stuff. Mm. So yeah, very, very difficult to dislike her. Um, not that I'm trying. <laughs> but, but, <yeah. laughs> and then throughout the 60s, she just became really well known as being on all the game shows, all the panel shows and stuff like that. She was a personality. Mm. In the 70s, Betty White, uh, she she started appearing in the Mary Tyler Moore show, which was a sitcom. And she was a supporting player in that. But that, again, ma- ma- she was a big, uh, a big uh, performance for her. Like, uh, she became very well known off the back of that. Which she was anyway. But, you know, this was a big show. And that finished in, in, in 1977. And so she was in really the same position. She She got her own show called The Betty White Show, which was a sitcom in 1977. It didn't last. They just did a handful of episodes. So they're both in the same position. Very well-known TV stars, but looking for the next big hit. They're in their 50s, you know, it's yeah. like f- trying to find something that fits for them. Just judging on that alone, I reckon they're going into this, look, hey, this is a big British show. We've se- we've started to see American versions of British shows do very well. This could really take off. We- and you've got Harvey Corman and Betty White. Mm. Two really reliable comedy performers. And I think there's there's a scene, there's a very early on scene where Betty White accidentally calls Henry, the Harvey Corman character, Rog, because she's just been on the phone to Rog. Wait a minute. How, how did you know? You hit it there. Roger, yeah. Henry, you are not. Yes, Roger, certainly on your mind. I know you're always it's talking to him. Mind. Slip of the mind. You are not going to hang him in the lobby again. I am so when I find the hammer. Where'd you hide it? And they just improv their way out of it. <laughs> Old pros, eh? So the question then, and, and maybe we, maybe we should return to this question at the end, but why didn't it take off <laughs> with that pedigree as you described it? 
I, I don't the know. expectations must have been so mm. high. They must have sort of got in there with with such belief mm. that this could be a thing. Yeah. yeah. But I think that basically the you know the American system of like they just throw so much shit at the wall and see what sticks. Um, mm. You know, it's just some That's things do, system, some things don't. I, I don't think it's it's not an easy thing to judge. Uh, well, at this stage, out in reception, a, a kind of Pee Wee Herman attired looking dude rocks up, <laughs> doesn't he? Ringing the bell and Henry goes out to demand that he stop that racket and wait his turn before <laughs> turning on his heel and going back into the office. Just showing his, his contempt that he has for all of his guests. Yeah, really quite nasty. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah, yeah. Just, it's not subtle, is it? He just shouts at the guests. It's not just snarky it's or narky, I should say. It's It's just downright obnoxious rude. This character was definitely Cribbins, Mr. Hutchison, but a much more sanitized and devoid of personality, really. He wasn't at all interesting or um, engaging like, like Cribbins' characters. That's a tough act to follow, though. When you watch Bernard Cribbins in Faulty Towers, there's a very much a sense of, like, I can't see anyone else playing this mm. in this way. You can give him the same script, you might get something else. Bernard Cribbins does a lot with that character. It's a fantastic performance. Yeah, Cleese is very, very... Um, complimentary in the dvd commentary of of cribbin's performance yeah. and now he recognizes the brilliance of it i think and and how it helped the pacing which is what cleese always talks mm. about there's something that you guys talked about in your deep dives was the the quality of the of the day players of the people who just come in for one episode the the, the mm. guest casting is amazing in faulty towers they were all john cleese's friends though they're all, yeah. they're all like <laughs> that's definitely who you know sure but well, my point is it's perhaps a little unfair it's a little unfair to compare this this guy, and I mean him no disrespect, but you know he's just a jobbing actor on a on a pilot to mm. to Bernard Cribbins, who's you know a hugely experienced comedic actor. There was one good visual gag where the, the goat's head is sitting on the counter, staring at the ceiling, and he sort of follows the goat's gaze up. <laughs> yeah, what's yeah. The goat looking at. I, yeah, I, I quite enjoyed that. <laughs> I really like that, and also that feels to me like something that is not in the script. That feels like something the actor's gone. Oh look, this is going to work. This prop does this. Let me play yeah, with maybe. that. Yeah, the, the actual, the actor who plays that, he's a jobbing actor, but he was a comedy specialist and he was, he's one of those people, you might not know his name, but you always knew his face. You know his like, face. Oh yeah, he's in that sort of thing. Uh, that's the sense I've got from uh, reading about him. Jack Dodson, his name is. I think he has been brought in to, to lend that kind of comedy chops to it. Mm. It's a shame that they can give him much to work with really then, isn't it? Yeah. And again, it's because, you know, this is a pilot. They've chopped up three plots mm. and sort of... Ch- push them together to try and pull something in. I guess all we're doing right now is comparing them to the scenes in Faulty Towers, which is sort of inevitable, but it's just done so much better <laughs> in every way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't as finessed as, as Faulty Towers. And just going back to something that you said before, Alan, about the, the lead being on sketch shows mm. i must admit now looking back thinking about when i watched it that saturday night live feel that that mm. live yeah. on the spot sketch show feel to what he was doing rather than a, a sitcom feel to what he was doing yeah. it did feel very like a live performance if that makes sense it does yes yeah. which i have to say i quite like that about sitcom i like that about your more classic 70s 80s sitcoms it's in front of an audience and I love it when you can really tell that they're playing off the audience, the, the rhythm is there. And I think you do get that here, actually. Mm. At this point, though, uh, Henry sort of is mindful that this guy might be one of the hotel inspectors. Henry gives him the key to his own bedroom because he wants to impress the guy. And he says, we'll move out, <laughs> which is a little bit OTT. That's it, that kind of... But that kind of spoils the point of like, oh, we're going to have to pretend this is a hotel room, but actually it's our room. If you just go to the guy, this is our room, we'll move out for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sort of exactly. the point, doesn't it? You're removing all the hilarity element, the farcical element of like, oh, now we have to get all our stuff out before he gets upstairs. With the There's case. a whole episode there, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, but, but that's what you were saying about crushing too many storylines into one here. Now, what would happen was Sybil doesn't know. And so she comes home half cut goes straight to the room, gets in bed with the man who's there. there <laughs> and she's Rice a bit itself. saucy because she's drunk, etc., yeah. uh, etc. Et <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and then immediately after this, we cut to the opening credits. Yeah. <laughs> Six yeah. minutes into a 22-minute episode. <laughs> this is a typical American device of the cold open, isn't it? Where you get... Yeah. yeah. Sometimes this was about five minutes. Sometimes it's eight minutes or so before the credits roll. And I'm like, Jesus, yeah. has this only just started? Well, there, presumably mm. there'd be an ad break there, would there? Yes. So yeah, you do this. You do a scene, get you into the episode, and then go to the adverts because no one's gonna go away then because they're involved yeah. in their entrenched. Yeah. And then at the end, the epi- basically the episode finishes. Then it goes to an advert. 
And then they come back for like a 30 second epilogue, which usually doesn't add anything to the show. But then it goes straight into the next show. So you get that inherited audience. Is that to is that to include more revenue from advertising to have like two ad breaks in one show? Yeah, I guess so. We would we only have one, don't we, in a half hour Mm. show. But it's specifically to if you put if you end the show and then have some adverts before the next show. You're going to go, oh, well, that show's finished. I'm no longer invested. I'll flick around. I'll see what else is on. But if you end the show and then 10 seconds later, you're watching the cold opening of the next show, you're you're in it. You're straight away in it. And then you're like, oh, yeah, actually, I quite like this. I'll just watch it. And then six minutes later, when there's an advert, you're like, oh, well, okay. You just don't know what's going on. What's I'll go make a cup of tea. (laughs) Yeah. I'm actually amazed that it never made its way over to Britain as a marketing strategy because it does make sense. It does, but there are, I'm not sure the details, but there are quite strict rules about how many adverts you're allowed to have in a specific period. Uh, so they can only fit in one ad break. So, you know. Yeah. Well, it's not out of a sense of decency, is it? <laughs> yeah, our, they our want to be companies. <laughs> <laughs> so what did we think of the theme tune for Snavely? It was very British sounding, lots of brass and woodwind with a maybe a little bit of slapstick percussion, almost Terry and June-esque, I thought. This is really interesting to me, Ben, because you, I know you're a musician yeah. and I don't remember the theme tune. I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> like, tell I, you. I, I, I got, I got You said it. theme tune, I thought there wasn't one, was there? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting your, uh, you, you, that you, you picked up on it, whereas it just went straight over my head. If you just... Bear with me. I'm going to look it up right now and, and play it and see it. So, yeah. <laughs> because I genuinely we'll, we'll, can't we'll remember let, it. We'll let it in. Right, we've just listened to it. Now I do remember it. Thank you. So uh, <laughs> I, cu- I couldn't agree more, Ben. I couldn't agree more. Very jaunty. Reg Varney could be getting on the bus and Blakey could be mugging at the camera. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we fade, we fade in after the credits to a busy dining room where we see Connie, which is the Polly character, no doubt named after yeah. Connie Booth, we assume. Yes. Mm. Um, she's serving dinner and messing about with the flowers, and we get a little bit of exposition that she is there to learn the hotel business. So she's not a, an art student or whatever. I like that. I like that little change of character because we don't really see much of her in this episode, but let's think in terms of they were trying to build something for a series. It really allows the Basil character to to be mentor and I think that suits that Basil character where he thinks oh, I'm so great I'm such a big shot I could teach other people mm-hmm. and it means she kind of has to look up to him especially if it's like oh I'm relying on him to like write a report to get college credit like, True. Yeah. it means there's a there's an authority element there she can't yeah. really push back too much I didn't like that they'd made her such an airhead and so yeah I mean so. that didn't yeah she just seemed very goofy. She was quite a goofy character, weren't she? She the way that she was laughing and didn't really seem to sort of catch on to what was what was going on. And yeah, she was very very different to the to the poly. She was recognisable, but not anything like the poly character. Yeah, but completely underwritten. Bizarrely, she was she was dressed in like a this like floral blouse and a powder pink skirt for her job and and waitressing. But there was no real. It didn't point to what she did within the hotel until they put that Victorian style maid hat on, which then <laughs> mm-hmm. indicated yeah. she's going to be a waitress. That's what she does. Yeah. So I'll, I'll buy that definition if the hat defines the waitress. Could yes. she have been wearing literally anything? But with that hat on, and you would have known she was a waitress. And you would have known. I, I think she could have. Yeah, she, yeah. I think she could. Okay. It felt more like yeah. a prop than, a, than, than fashion. It felt like it was just an indicator of, this is who this is. This is the this is the waitress. Everybody. We we talked about in our episode uh, on Faulty Towers that my first feeling about Polly was like, ah, she doesn't do anything. Like, what's the point? Then as you watch more, it's like, okay, you do need that person there. You need that kind of sense of reality there to offset mm. the craziness. But obviously, we're losing that with this character. And I think that the Sybil proxy here yeah. is the normal one in this bizarre world. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. yeah. They've certainly swapped some of Sybil and Polly's character traits, haven't they? And not to the benefit of the show, I don't think, really. Yeah, agreed. Well, what we're seeing here is is Betty White's Sybil is 
is fraternizing with a male guest and this male mm-hmm. guest has got very out of control eyebrows, hasn't he? He's sort of waggling his eyebrows all over the show, <laughs> um, <laughs> overacting somewhat. And, and this is all to Henry's disdain. And it, it, it sort of comes back to what I said earlier, that Henry's clearly got this jealous streak that Basil didn't have. He's really mm, worried yeah. and he accuses Betty White Sybil of fooling around with one of the guests again. So in the seed that she's quite yes, promiscuous. I that as well. He seems a bit of a, I'm going to use a word that kids use. He seems a bit of a cuck, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what that I, means. I only sort of 80% know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, you're right. She's she's very flirtatious. And I, I picked up on that. He said, oh, you're messing with the guest again. Mm. Um, but then, then there's, of course, there's a punchline. There's a visual punchline where he takes his, his little uh, bib off and he's a vicar. And that's the... You know, oh, obviously there's no sexual threat. He's a vicar, which I'm not sure that lands quite as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hashtag different times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Next in the scene, we get we get to be introduced to the US version of the Major, who's a very problematic character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. His name's the Chief. Very. He's a retired police chief rather than a war veteran. I mean, he's ostensibly the same character at heart because he's, you know, a poor memory, a bit dotty. He likes to read the papers. He seems more aware of it. He seems more aware of his of his poor memory slash dementia. I thought he seemed drunk. All right. Mm. And this got me thinking because I've never considered the Major to be a drunk. But now when I think about it, I'm like, yeah, a <laughs> bit dotty, but yeah, yeah, a little bit. Had a few sherries, you know. Uh, yeah. Basil, Basil refers to the Major as an old sot a, a couple of times, I think. Yeah. So. But when you think of the major, you don't think, oh, he's a drunk. Like, no. I can see that he might be, but that's not his characteristic. Whereas no. this guy, the chief, is like, oh, this guy's just an, an aggressive drunk. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the major, you, you consider a, ra- a racist, but you don't consider a rapist, either, which is what this <laughs> no. this guy, this the chief, yeah. there's a very questionable choice of gag where yeah. he did. So, uh, yeah, he's a sex predator. first introduction, <laughs> lovely little rape joke, different time. Ah. Indeed. It seems to me there was only one case of alleged rape in 12 years. A remarkable record, Chief. If that cashier hadn't pressed charges against me, we wouldn't have had any. <laughs> you, Chief? Oh, she was jaywalking, and I pulled her over for a sobriety test. Sobriety test? You mean she charged you with rape just for making her blow up a balloon? We had another test. I don't care to hear about it. Do you think there is a lot of thought into this? This isn't a couple of writers coming up with an original idea and and trying to develop it and then having to sell it to a studio and having to really justify all your choices or, dare I say, have some sort of artistic creative vision behind it. This is, look, this show is popular. Let's see if we can remake it and make some money. Yeah, you're probably right. And you just hire in a couple of, you know, old hands, directors, a couple of script writers, knock this together for us, will you? Yeah. Write this, do it as like a Harvey Corman type. It feels like they've like they've sat back on the laurels a little bit, expecting the vehicle to drive itself. Mm. Whereas maybe if they'd, if they'd done a little bit more with making it into its own thing, it could have been a success from, from the start and actually become something. This, this is a symptom of, of the US approach to comedy, though. Is they try and churn out 24 episodes a series and, you know, they don't take the time to craft six excellent episodes. I suppose it depends what your objective is, isn't it? Fill, if your objective is to fill the schedules and sell advertising, then who cares yes. how good it is? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mr. Bishop, which is um, the Hutchison character, the Cribbins character, he pops out to make a phone call. And uh, meanwhile, Gladys shows another guest, Mr. Foley, into the dining room and allocates him Mr. Bishop's empty table. Pedro comes over to take his order, which he obviously doesn't understand. And then Henry comes back in demanding to know who this new guest is and why he's, why he's sitting at Bishop's table and forcibly moves him. I know we're doing the comparison thing again, but he's far more, he's far ruder than Basil. Basil's ru- mm. rudeness is subtle, I think. Basil has his moments, but it's usually build up to it. Yeah, it's it's a pace, like we've said, isn't it? He doesn't go yeah. from zero to 60 in, uh, at such a pace as, as Henry here does. And Henry explains to Foley that Pedro's an Albanian refugee at this point. He can't speak English, mm. and you might as well give your order to the cat, which is a, another line directly Aww. from Paul too. But then he wishes him a bon appetite. Is that how they say it in America? <laughs> bon appetite. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> they don't even bother putting a French inflection on it. <laughs> so there's... There's a v- physical gag here, which I quite liked, and I can't remember if it is a Manuel thing or not, or if it's new, where 
the man points at the menu, like saying, I want this, to Petro, and, and Petro just puts his finger on the menu he and then tries to walk to, the yeah, to walk to the <laughs> ship. Is that a new gag? I don't remember. Yeah, that. I think new that gag. New. Yeah, that I like works. that. I'm it all right with that. Good. Yeah, that was fine. But then they overcooked it. They overegged it by making him put his finger through the menu slightly later, mm. didn't yeah. they? Mm. <laughs> didn't yeah. Really yeah. Just as in the original, Henry is told by his wife that Bishop isn't a hotel inspector. He sells hardware, not not spoons, <laughs> like Mr. Hutchison. <laughs> so, so Snavely is 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 outraged that he was pretending to be a hotel inspector, which of course he wasn't. And he pulls up a, a seat right at Bishop's table to intimidate him, which is mm. a little bit weird. And and Connie brings the wrong order. Bishop starts complaining, and and like we're saying, the pacing's off because. Henry immediately declares, right, Mr. Bishop is taking over and running the hotel and he's almost about to assault Bishop before before Gladys comes in and and prevents that from happening. What you get with Basil a lot is the passive aggressiveness. Is that quite a British thing? Americans are just a bit more in your face about things, aren't they? Yeah, Yeah, I think that, that when you said earlier that he's rude, he's not rude, he's exasperated and people just get in his way. Whereas this character is directly rude at you. Thank you very much. And it's yeah. just a bit, it just feels a bit more personal. And perhaps that's, perhaps that is a British thing, that passive aggressiveness. Yeah, it's, it's far more obvious and out there, isn't it? Snavely's rudeness. Mm. It's more aggressive. Yeah, he's definitely aggressive. But what Henry does at this point is, much like Basil, he, he flips from being obnoxious, although in a different way, he flips to that sort of sycophantic, fastidious mode, trying to make sure everything is to Mr. Foley's liking. But, yeah, again, it's over-egged because rather than just smelling um, the cottage cheese on Mr. Foley's plate, he actually dips his hooter right into it, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Before declaring it yeah. smells good. It's a little bit much. Yeah, and it would, like the, the gag of dragging his plate out from under him and having a big old lung full of it, a big... <sighs> That would have been. That, that's funny. Yeah, that's. You don't fine. need to have cut his cheese on the end of his nose when he puts it down. No. You know what really struck me about this? The the man orders the diet plate. Yeah. Oh, I wrote this yeah. down. What's a diet plate? I wanted to know what was on that plate. Well, it has cottage cheese on it, I suppose. That's your diet oh. cheese. <laughs> How is cottage cottage cheese in the diet food? Is it? Maybe it wasn't. I don't, I don't know. It is in America. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. True. Everything's got a spartame in rather than sugar on the diet plate. Yeah. It's like it's like a restaurant with one vegetarian option. Would you like the <laughs> lamb, the chicken, the fish, or the vegetarian option? Whatever the hell that is. <laughs> we get um we actually get Harvey Corman's best bit, in my opinion. You guys might disagree with this, but Mr. Bishop shouts over to summon Snavely. So Snavely and, and Harvey Corman sort of turns around and does a really really good sneer almost something like <laughs> like Gru from Despicable Me would do it sort of turns <laughs> and growls and sneers in the direction of this guy and then he gets he gets physical with him doesn't he it all, it all gets yeah. a bit physical this is point. this yeah. is a, another example of just not doing the pacing Mr. Bishop's mm. dissatisfied they messed up his bill so Snavely starts to choke him straight off the bat <laughs> just chokes him yeah. not only does he choke him he picks him up punches him at least four times in the guts gives him a, a few slugs <laughs> right in the midriff and then um, puts him in a headlock so Bishop certainly has more of an excuse to have lost consciousness than Mr. Hutchison did in Faulty Towers because mm. he gets a, yeah. a severe beating really doesn't he <laughs> exactly I've written down here it was too this is too violent but, but <laughs> yes but I think I think actually on reflection it's not that it's too violent it's 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 too unsubtle that, that's the truth yeah. it. it's just too brutal is perhaps a better word because <laughs> it's got a double meaning <laughs> but yeah, yeah it's just unsubtle and then in the next scene when we fade up this being America Gladys says Mr Bishop's going to sue us <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's yes. very american and that's that scene done. We can move on. Forget that happened. <laughs> We've got a fire alarm to deal with. Yeah, it's it's basically... Mm, the, really they, clunky, isn't it? They've crowbarred yeah. in the second episode they wanted to um, adapt here. Yeah. And this is Henry saying he's going to impress Mr. Foley by running a fire alarm. Because obviously guests love nothing more than being disturbed by a fire drill. I don't really follow the <laughs> budget, but... Um, to be fair, though, the, the fire alarm, the Germans episode where the fire alarm happens in Faulty Towers, it's a whole hodgepodge of things. That's not a, that is not a well-structured episode. It's just mm. like, oh, here's the hospital thing. Oh, here he's gone uh, for a fire alarm. Oh, now there's some Germans here and he's doing a German accent. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't yeah. work particularly well as a structure. But, I don't uh, think it does. And I think it's one of the most overrated Faulty episodes. But I was on the subreddit yeah. for Faulty Towers the other day and it was voted the best episode in series one. Really? No. No, I yeah. agree with you. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, it, it's certainly not my favourite. I think perhaps relative to what we're talking about now, one of the reasons it's not my favourite is it's just a bit much. It's a little mm. bit too much. You, you know, said that, didn't turned you? Turned up a little we, bit too high. 
yeah, just too frenetic and just mm. too, yeah, chaotic and you don't know what's coming next and mm. the, the flow was just off in that episode. But I think, I think I, f- I feel like this episode of, of Snavely is very similar. Things yes. just seem to have been thrown in yeah. and it all just goes off and you don't know which way things are, things are going. It, it's, I, yeah. I think your phrase was migraine inducing. <laughs> yes, it, yes. I found that I found quite a lot of faulty toe was quite migraine inducing though. Yeah. <laughs> Dear John will be a lot more gentle, I promise. I know, I'll be able to just lie down with the blanket on. Amazing. <laughs> Mr. Foley appears at this point demanding to know what's going on, and Henry says it's a test of the system declaring to him Your valuables are snafe at Savely Manor, which just <laughs> didn't then. land, did it? Now then mm. one of my well our listeners will know, one of my pet hates is the fake Freudian tits, I mean slip, <laughs> right? I hate that. I absolutely hate that. But but very close behind it is the fake spoonerism where they do yeah. something like this and it's just terrible. Like no one speaks like that. No one ever says that. It's not a thing that happens in reality. Mm. No. As, as word salad goes, it's not convincing, is it? No. no. Your valuables are snafe here at Savely Manor. Oh my, oh my God. I think even, the way, even the way he delivers it, you see, and he's, ha- he's having to concentrate to deliver it right. Yes. <laughs> to get it wrong. Yes. <laughs> so it transpires that Pedro got confused between the burglar and the fire alarm. He's already turfed everyone out of the dining room when the burglar alarm went off. What's the semitone higher? Well, we don't get that, do we, here? We, we, it's <laughs> almost the exposition is this all happened off camera. Just deal with it because mm. it'll confuse yeah. you. So. Yeah, it is. It's Petro's ushered everyone out of the restaurant into the in, into the driveway. That might be funny if we saw that, him panicking mm. and running around in a Manuel kind of way. But we don't. We just get someone else telling us that it's happened. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then we get a flashback to the chief is a rapist joke when Connie declares oh, yeah, she won't Connie. go upstairs to lead the guests to the fire escape because the last time she went up there, the chief tried to give her a sobriety test. Oh, good old Connie being sexually harassed in the world. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how we laugh. <laughs> And talk of the devil, a creepy old predator turns up in the lobby at this point, doesn't he? Brandishing a Colt 45 and yelling, you're under mm-hmm. arrest. <laughs> yeah, what yeah. Because he thinks the burglar alarm's gone off. Oh, by the way, we, we, we must have that. Pedro, when uh, Faulty is trying to, Snavely is trying to explain burglar to him, he says, bandito? <laughs> is that Albanian? <laughs> bandito? Albanian. Is that Albanian? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, I have not got a word of Albanian, so it might be. It might be Albanian for, um, for burglar, but it sounds suspiciously like Spanish to me. Mm. <laughs> but at this point, the pandemonium has led all the guests to, into the lobby, so they're all stood around waiting for the fire drill, much to Henry's irritation, um, just like just like the Faulty Towers episode. However, unlike the Faulty Towers episode, we, we pan to the kitchen and we see Pedro's, presumably is cooking up an Albanian stew or something. Is it a paella equivalent of yeah. um, in Albania? It's apropos of nothing that he just seems to be cooking. I mean, I suppose they've got no chef in this one. There's no Terry. Mm-hmm. No. But it just suits the mashed up plot that he is cooking and starts a real life fire coinciding with the drill. And just like in, yeah. in the faulty original, Henry slash Basil ignores Pedro slash Manuel when he's shouting fire, fire, and he locks him in the kitchen. Exactly the same, except presumably the actor didn't get third-degree burns like Andrew Sachs. Um, yeah, and a payoff. Yeah, and a payoff from the BBC of like 100 quid or something pathetic. Yeah, Ooh, Righteous bucks. Well, well, that's more than he earned for the for doing all the <laughs> <Yeah>. Probably. <laughs> he's on eight, eight quid a week or something. Yeah. Um, there were lots of floaty fabrics, floaty man-made fabrics, um, I should add, on display, which were mm-hmm. obviously de rigueur at the time. And they were probably advised to not see it, sit near any um, like open flames <laughs> because it, everything would have just gone up, I think. Do you know what? I thought that, actually, when Petro accidentally starts the fire, I yes. just I thought his hair looks very flammable. <laughs> yeah, just gone. Like Michael Jackson in the Pepsi advert. Exactly, oh, yeah. It was just a bit too yeah, I, know. I was worried. <laughs> well that leads me in nicely to, to Petro actually. Um so like the, the Manuel character, um he's dressed in, in what we recognise as being sort of like that bellboy waiter hotel mm. uniform. Although they have done a massive transformation and he's he's sort of gone from the, the chef's whites look that he had um to this strong mustard yellow 
colour of very jacket. Stri- a completely shapeless jacket as well. It's just like it a was, boxy yeah. Wearing. It was. It was like he was like a small child wearing his dad's suit. <laughs> just very sort of boxy looking with like a black trim around around the cuffs. Um so that straight away was something that was markedly different. What I what I like about Manuel actually is that when we see him relaxing in Basil the Rat, he's in his bedroom. Yes. He's got his work clothes on underneath his dressing gown. <laughs> underneath his dressing gown. I loved that. Because yeah. um, he can just take it off at like a moment's notice and yeah. then rush back down and just carry on with his job, which I'm sure he, it probably happened. That's the, that's the word I kept using about Manuel. He's just so sweet. He is so sweet. <laughs> he is so sweet. And that's what I think this character didn't have. No. It didn't have that sweetness to it, yeah. unfortunately. So at this point, smoke's billowing out of the kitchen and Snavely starts yelling, fire, fire, run for your lives. And Henry accidentally sets off the the extinguisher directly into Mr. Foley's midriff. This is, okay, right. We finally get some slapstick, which is what I want from a Faulty Towers style show, okay? You need a bit of physical comedy in there. Yeah. We're finally doing something and the camera misses the money shot. The extinguisher (laughs) goes off all over this guy and it's just looking at his face. And then awkwardly pans down, like zooms out and pans <laughs> to down. Crotch. And like, oh, look, there's all the extinguisher fluid. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I'm glad you picked up on that. That was weird. I, I, and I thought, well, is that deliberate? Or, or did they only got one suit? They can't do it again? I, I, don't, know, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> I, I think there is a fair bit of slapstick in this, to be honest. There's, there's Henry gets his tie stuck in the drawer early on. And oh, then yeah, um, yeah. Pedro's finger going through the menu that we mentioned the assault on Mr. Bishop's fairly slapstick. Mm. And then here we get we get Pedro hanging onto Snavely's feet, don't we? As he's dragged yeah. through the... Even after the fire threat has passed. Yeah. yeah, I'm not really sure why that's happening, but it's quite funny. But that's the beauty of when it, when it happens in Faulty Towers. You know, Basil locks Manuel in a burning kitchen, doesn't realise it's burning. And then so when he finally lets him out, and this is the crucial element of these characters, Manuel says, oh, thank you, you've saved me. Or, you know, whatever he actually yeah, says. that's missed here, right? Like, but that's the whole point of the Manuel character. You bully him and berate him, but then when you stop, he's like, oh, great, you've made my life better by stopping. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> he's a, a, an eternal optimist in many ways. Uh, yeah, so we don't get any of that, sort of, the, the, the levels of character in that. He just decides to fall to the floor and then grab onto the guy's legs. Yeah, but weirdly, rather than look at Henry with contempt for balls and everything up, Lovely Betty White Sybil is like, oh, come here and have a hug and consoles him and tells him he can hang up his goat and she'll even help and gives him a lovely warm embrace and it's like a lovely, cuddly, warm, everything's all right in the end finale, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, well, that's, that's, a, that's a good observation, Ben, because Sybil would never have done that. She would have been sort of contempt <laughs> She'd have for batted him. him. Yeah. She'd have batted him with the with Withering look and just walked yeah. away, probably. Yeah, a withering look. That's, that's, the, that's mm. the Sybil way. She just seemed far more a loving character and less acerbic. And the, the playoff between her and her and her husband was fun to watch. But I just I generally thought that she was a, a nice character, a nice person. Whether it had legs or not, if it had been picked up, I don't know. I, I think the big problem with this is that it's only got two characters, really. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with a couple of other little sort of cipher characters. Whereas Faulty Towers had four, it was an ensemble, it had four, yes. yeah. four main actors. And one thing that they always did with Faulty Towers was uh, not only with your four main characters, as in everyone was involved and you could throw in, oh, here's an idea. You know, the writing was there, but you could chip in and it was kind of an open forum. You have guest stars coming in each week. And because John Cleese is casting people that he knows, he's worked Mm. with before, he's bringing in people he can trust. So they're welcome to kind of go, oh, I was thinking about doing this. What do you think of that? But with this, you've got Harvey Corn and Betty White. Like I say, they're TV royalty, even at this stage. They're well-known people. And you've got that other bloke and that other woman who are nobodies, complete nobodies. But I'm assuming, you know, I'm sure Betty White and Harvey Corman are wonderful to work with. But that's not a balanced system, is it? It's not a... It's not, uh, it's not a system where you go, oh, we better make sure these guys get some good lines as well. Mm. You've yeah. got two actors yeah. that you're selling this on and you give them all the, all the material. And if anything, it looked like it, it was going to just show a, a frustrated hotelier in a happy marriage, which wasn't really the faulty premise at all, <laughs> was it? Maybe, maybe no. 1970s America couldn't handle a battle axe undermining the male yeah. lead. I don't know. But mm. I just thought without that conflict between, you know, there was a lot of sexual, repressed sexual energy in Basel. It's yes. just not, not evident here at all. He's probably getting his oats every night, this fella. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, a beautiful 70s sitcom phrase, getting your oats. Um, <laughs> um, with, oh, a bit of cramping. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Why Basil works so well is because everything in the world is designed to infuriate him. So his wi- his marriage is, you know, a constant frustration. The yeah. hotel guests are a frustration. Everything about the hotel, everything he's trying to do, it's going to break or something's going to fall apart or whatever. You know, he gets builders in and they're useless. And as much as you can say, a lot of that is his own fault and whatever. But that that's the whole point. That's the constant stress, the stress, the stress. And we build and we build and we build until we get to a point where he finally breaks and thrashes the car or whatever. Mm. Whereas this, yeah, you, it's just like, why is this guy angry? He's He's got, he's got mm. a nice supportive wife who's obviously trying to help. And we don't even get, oh, I wish this person, my employees were better. I'm so frustrated by this guy because you don't get a chance to build on that. It's just like, oh, he doesn't speak English. He's a bit of an idiot. Sorry. Although you have to say he doesn't assault the Manuel character in the same way that Cleese Mm. did, which I think is probably a good thing. I was always a little bit uncomfortable with. You know, when he like pokes him in the eye and hits him on the head with Mm -hmm. a spoon, it's just a bit much. This is a weird thing to say because we've just listed all the horrible things about Basil Fawlty, but he is sympathetic. You can kind of, you do feel sympathy for him yeah. because you see the circumstances that have driven him to where he's got to. Yeah, and that's Sybil a lot of the time. That's why you need Sybil to be this sort of dragonfly. <laughs> but so without without that, Betty White's doing a great job, but without that instigator of Sybil. Yeah. Yeah. He's just he's just a horrible bloke. <laughs> that's not good. that's not yeah. good enough. That's not that's yeah. not that's not subtle enough. No. What about props? Was there any any 1970s props that you noticed that anyone noticed that jumped out at you? I've got one. When um Snavely was at the desk signing in one of the guests and he was sort of making notes on 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 a sort of wooden bureau type thing that was sat on top of the counter and then he spun the thing around 180 <laughs> degrees so that the, so that the customer could could sign the bit of paper i thought that was brilliant it was like a it was like a, a rotational bureau it was fantastic oh i like everything in the 70s rotated and i love that <laughs> we, had, we had um uh, it was called right it, it was called a party susan and it's what you put all your you you <laughs> your nuts and your crisps in uh-huh. and it, you put it in the middle of the table and you spun it round is it a lazy susan it was a lazy Susan, yes. but in yeah. my house we called it a party Susan, <laughs> and nobody else in the world called it that. <laughs> and I just, yeah, I, my family's got all sorts of little isms like that, and it was a party. Yeah, that is. A, do you know what? That is a really, that is a really sound observation. Everything in the seventies rotated. You are, <laughs> you are <laughs> so <rotated>. right. <laughs> Well, that is Snavely pretty well covered, I think you'll agree. Uh, thank you very much, Ben and Al, for joining us. Thanks a lot for having us. Thank guys. you so much. Yeah, it's been lovely having you. And uh, where can people find your podcast if they want to go a deeper dive into the world of Faulty Towers and uh, Dear John to come? You can find us on Facebook if you search up Sado Podcast. We also have a, our own Facebook group, um, which we have listeners join and share memes and rare videos and things mm. like that. We've got lots of um, rare videos and behind the scenes stuff from Faulty Towers that a lot of people said they'd never seen before so that's kind of cool we're on Twitter at Sado Podcast on Instagram at Sado Podcast you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts also we have our own website Sado.club where we have some blog posts and we have a quiz on there I'm going to put a Faulty Towers quiz on there actually fairly soon Mm. but there's a good life quiz if you're a good life aficionado and you want to test your knowledge take the quiz if you want to find us we're pretty easy to find yes but yes thank you very much and we will be back we hope to have our new series up and running fairly soon uh, but due to technical errors of having a job um, <laughs> we're slightly behind schedule yeah <laughs> who would have thought Alan would get a job uh, it, it, it's a, it's, it comes as big a surprise to me as anyone yeah. <laughs>